Today, on a very special Pride edition of Sagittarian Matters, we have a crossover episode with Professor Karen Tonkson of The Gay Amazing Race and Waiting to Exhale in the studio to talk with me about the ultimatum, queer love. Stay tuned. Sagittarian Matters Sagittarian Matters What's the Hello from the Sagittarian Matters Social Distancing Studios in Los Angeles, California. Listeners, it is the evening after Dyke Day. Queer Nation has reformed in Los Angeles in response to Proud Boys showing up to protest Pride in Glendale. And my queer social circles have become bewitched with a television show called The Ultimatum Queer Love. In this show, a group of couples enter the Netflix reality show arena to drink out of metal goblets for continuity's sake and figure out if they are going to marry their partner who has been putting the squeeze on them to tie the knot. As we know from watching The Amazing Race and talking about it, marriage is the ultimate set of stakes in reality show land, and these people, aged 24 to 42 years old, are no different. They are all jonesing for a ring. Well, half of them are. Then they swap partners and decide what they're going to do. If you have not watched The Ultimatum, please go watch all 10 hours of it so you can kill the same amount of brain cells I have. Then listen to Karen's special episode of Waiting to Exhale featuring several friends to the show. And then come back and listen to us talk about the finale and the reunion. Okay, great. Have you done it? Perfect. Okay, before we begin, some stray thoughts. As of June 10th in the year of our Lord, 2023, Yoli has announced on TikTok that Mal cheated on her before the show. And that was why Mal was so cool with her polyamorous stint. This is what Yoli says on TikTok. Take, I'm just reporting the news. Don't get mad at the messenger. Okay. Also in social media land, you can hire Tiff to have a friend conversation with you via Zoom for $75, or they'll coach you through coming out to your parents for $150. What a savings. Okay. Also, Lexi has gone sort of butch since the show and posted this week an Instagram photo set wearing like wraparound sunglasses and like an oversized sleeveless open button up uh, shirt and it has slicked back hair. Um, I already knew this. It's not an update, but I just want to remind you Mildred is a Zumba teacher in San Diego. Go take her class. Or get your tarot cards read by Sam, whose tarot business is called Saucy Tarot. That is saucy as in Aussie, her partner, with the letter S in front of it. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. God, the dog thing was really intense. Can we all agree the dog thing was really intense? Can you at least look at my dog like you care about her? That's what she deserves. She's 12 years old. If you don't want to sleep with my dog, I'm sleeping on the couch. Nothing has <laughs> nothing has ever been more accurate representation <laughs> of lesbian culture and queer culture than somebody screaming at you to look at their dog with some fucking respect because she's 12 years old and she's not going to put up with this anymore. Also, all the dogs laying on the beds while the different queer people are having sex on the beds. I'm sorry, dogs. There needs to be a support group or reunion for the dogs. Okay, there's lots to talk about, but let's get to my talk with Karen Tonkson. Hi, listeners. I wanted to give you a content warning. When we begin to talk about the reunion um, from the ultimatum, we will be mentioning domestic violence. So take care of yourself. Do what you need to do. I wanted to let you know. Karen Tonkson is the award-winning author of Why Karen Carpenter Matters and Relocations, Queer Suburban Imaginaries. Karen's forthcoming book, Norm Porn, Television and the Spectacle of Normalcy, will be out later this year. She currently chairs the department of GSS at USC, where she's professor of gender studies and sexuality, English and American studies and ethnicity. You may also recognize Karen as the co-host of the podcasts Waiting to Exhale and The Gay Amazing Race with yours truly. 
Karen joined me in the Sagittarian Matters Social Distancing Studios via Zoom to talk about this very important reality show moment of our time, the finale and reunion of the ultimatum Queer Love. Now, please enjoy my talk with friend to the show, Professor Karen Thompson. Karen Thompson, welcome to this very special crossover episode of Sagittarian Matters. There are so many crossings. It's like the dizzying lines of Shane's L word chart. There's so many interlocking intimacies, pod intimacies here from waiting to exhale to, of course, our shared pod baby, the gay amazing race, which uh, with which this particular discussion has so much in common because you know, we're reviewing a reality show, but the best part of it is we don't have to make the gay stuff up. This is the show I wish we had or been recapping. Or is it recapping. the worst part? Is yeah. it the worst part? I mean, I wish we had been recapping something this juicy the whole time mm-hmm. instead of yeah. having to see whose leader hose and looked the most feminine. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, that said, I don't know how sustainable the concept is. I mean, look, the concept is sustainable insofar as there would be new couples infusing the ultimatum uh we work, we live type situation in San Diego. Um, But the unsustainable part of it is, will we get away with more queer love seasons? Because, you know, like with the real world series, once people figured out the shtick, they just start acting out and doing all sorts of stuff. I feel like there's something about these, this particular inaugural crew that were, we got to see all of their warts and all of their, you know, crazy expressions of self. Uh, yeah. Without too much thought process leading up to it, or maybe, I don't know. I don't know how you feel about that. That's a good, that's a good question. It's kind of like, remember I was, I was, I've been thinking recently about the first season of survivor that I watched Mm. and how Richard Hatch, like making alliances was scandalous. Oh yeah. It was like, what? He did what? (laughs) That's how we played the game. Whoa. It felt, it felt truly scandalous. And like something we had never seen before. And now an alliance is like the bare minimum. Yeah. Like you, you hit the beach you're on the boat and you're trying to like give eye contact, you know, hey, hey, you, me, Alliance, what? Well, you know, trying to foment alliances instantly. I feel like I would really choose a dud immediately as proven by, I'm going to segue to my first question for you. And I'll tell you why I'm saying this. Um, who would you choose as your trial marriage spouse based on just the first episode or two, not based on everything, you know, because I, my best self would have chosen Mal, but I do feel like I would have chosen Aussie because I would have been like, (laughs) Aussie's wearing a collared shirt and Aussie is old. So Aussie must be the most mature. Aussie's 42. So Aussie must be the most mature of this whole bunch. And then I would have chosen Aussie. And then we saw what happened. Well, my question is, you know, like the thing is that's presuming that someone goes into the project with a certain earnestness and choosing a trial spouse, meaning that it's got to be somebody you think you could end up leaving the show with. Whereas I think that actually even some of the contestants this season selected trial spouses that would keep intact, maybe their couple to like, you know, their, their couple dumb that wouldn't threaten the pre-existing couple too much in their mind. See, Ponyo agrees with that. Ponyo agrees. Yes. Um, Ponyo so agrees that some people, I think, went in there. I think that that's the Vanessa strategy. Like, it it was at once to create a little bit of drama and to get back at Lexi, but it's also sort of, it was also sort of, you know, a strange choice insofar as it seemed like it hedged her bets, Mm -hmm. right? Hedged her bets a little bit. Um, And it didn't seem, I think that Xander, maybe there was some codependent negotiation leading up to that choice where it's like, no, Xander, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to choose anybody that threatens your, I don't know, masculinity that threatens your, you know, fuckboy status or what have you. I think it's interesting that you call Xander a fuckboy. Cause I, I mean, it's true. <laughs> Wait, 
But Karen, who would you have chosen? Well, that's the thing. Okay, so who's who, your earnest spouse? Who's your strategic spouse? My earnest spouse. I mean, it's so hard because it's like no one, like no one there, really does it for me in terms of just like attraction. You know, none of these people are compatible within my wheelhouse of tastes. Uh, but earnest spouse, I think you know, I'd probably end up being assigned a spouse, kind of like. Uh, Tiff and Mildred and Ozzy and Sam. I feel like um, the pragmatic spousal selection would have been Sam, because because you know I was like okay, Sam uh, Sam and I we would have maybe presumptive common ground in some way about being gay in in the world together, and there can't be that much conflict, can there? That would be my thought process around selecting, you know, my er, uh, my um strategic spouse, my non-threatening spouse. But yeah, earnest spouse, there's nobody that I would really choose earnestly in that group. You have to choose. <laughs> Gun to my head. Uh, God, that that's a tough one. I, I selected, and again, I was really flipping about this. I selected Mal as my, uh, in a round of fuck, Mary kill. I chose Mal to marry because I think our Virgoan energies would work well in a household together. And it may be sort of asexual or a little like gay ass play or something like that. But, you know, um, yeah. So, so maybe I'll stick with Mal as like the earnest choice. Cause also Mal is legitimately, I think the hottest person there. Or I could see Mal in a mask for mask relationship. Like, remember that moment where it was like, was it like Mal and Tiff or Mal and another? Mal and Tiff negotiating and, top negoti- bottom. But I mean, I'm just like, that's a double bottom like zone right there. I don't think that Tiff is a bottom, but I, because Greta said this on the group thread yesterday <laughs> that Tiff was a bottom and it really beguiled me. I was just like, what? Because I think of Tiff as a service top who would, whose masculinity or it would, because when we saw when, when Mildred pulled out the Teddy, in episode one, and they were doing it, Mal was like grabbing uh, her neck from behind and like kind of like being the boss in that way. And so I was like, oh, okay, I get what this person's deal is. But I mean, I, yeah. I'm i happy to understand them as a the bottom, but I could see Mal as as being more that person. The, tr- the, true, the true answer though, is that, you know, I've already married a Vanessa in the past. <laughs> <laughs> and I've already married a Tiff in the past. I've, I've already yeah. dated a Tiff in the past. So, so I already married a <laughs> Vanessa in the past. If I, my college girlfriend turned um, commitment ceremony, quote unquote, wife, you know, not yeah. legally gay married wife from college, where we did get married after having been together through college for three to four years, I think. And like in a year after college, we we got married. We almost broke up two weeks before the wedding because she totally was <laughs> Vanessaing out. She went to look for a place for us in San Francisco, <sighs> and like then went to remember the cafe in San Francisco in the Castro, like that dance place. And I guess she claims that she only flirted with someone, but I'm pretty sure she hooked up with like at least one or two people while she was apartment hunting for us post marriage. And then like we got married anyway after some crisis. And then we broke up like six months later, essentially yeah. after the, the ceremony that was very performative and expensive. So, you know, I think I have really moved beyond that at this point. I have a pretty stable relationship world and existence now uh, and, and much more mature than I was when I was 22, okay, when I did this. But I definitely chose to marry a Vanessa in the past, so I'm not putting it past me to have done that pressed by the reality competition circumstances to make the same mistake. Well, because we know from being friends with Sarah Shapiro, Sarah Gertrude Shapiro, who worked on The Bachelor and who made the show Unreal, we know a little bit about how the reality show Sausage is made. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, I mean, I just feel like if we got in there, if you and Sarah went on this show or me and Kaya went on this show or whatever, (laughs) or however we got there, and we were just uh, sleep deprived, 
underfed, over alcoholed in those little tin cups. Yes. And we weren't allowed to read anything or listen to anything or talk about anything except for the game and the other people. And we just had producers juicing us up every day about who they kind of were trying to guide us towards. Mm-hmm. I feel like any of us could fall for this shit. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Uh, I think that I'm not sure what a producer, what pairing a producer would have manufactured for me, but, you know, um, it would have been fascinating. But this is why I think that that's when, you know, you get the first few couples paired up during the selection ceremony. You just realize that there's going to be a default scenario at the end. If you're like the last to choose then you're going to be like Mildred with Ozzy. Like what? I don't think that that was like an earnest selection. Absolutely. No. Well, that's the thing is like, I feel like Tiff has more kind of like, I don't want to say like macho top energy, but more, you know, more like Tiff's more. I don't know how to describe (laughs) Tiff's. It's very, Tiff's vibe is very different than Ozzy's vibe. Oh yeah, Aussie Aus- is very like like allow me to recede into my mock turtle neck vibe. Yeah, Auss- you know? Aussie's gentle, seeming shy seeming. guy, seeming person. That and that's the key word is the seeming part. But at really first blush, like tantrum, tantrum, tantrum person, tantrumy person. But wait, before we get ahead of ourselves, for anyone who has not watched the show, here's the gist <laughs> of the show. The first season was straight people. This season is queer love. How could they ever go back? I don't know. But -hmm. basically couples who have been dating from any time between a year and a half to three or four years, one of them has issued an ultimatum. You better marry me or we're breaking up, which seems like a weird choice. Just we have to be together. It's like tenure. We have to be together forever. And if we're not, for, then we have to walk away forever. Never speak again. Yeah. And that's the ultimatum that they're walking in with. But then in order to like figure out if they want marriage, they have to go match up with a sexy stranger who they're maybe compatible with based on one of these Netflix compatibility tests. Mm-hmm. Based on Netflix compatibility tests, they're getting thrown into a batch of other couples and they all have some kind of compatibility with other people there. They figure out who that is through a series of speed dating. And then that has to be their trial. Somebody else has to be their trial wife for three weeks after which they go back to their original partner for three weeks and then decide who to marry or who to walk away from forever. Yeah, exactly. You have only three options. <laughs> marry the person who you came with, marry the person who you met or leave single. There's no, Oh, like, you know, this, this transformed my relationship to relationships. Yeah. And I can now like proceed in a more gentle and loving way with you or in a more attentive and present way with you. Um, It's just like, but, but I think that it's really, you know, something that Palomi said on a pod episode that we did. It's, it's like really um, very clear that it's working with marriage as it's organizing principle because the institution of marriage is basically that it's like, it demands like, you know, your absolute assent to like the structure of marriage and and you're supposed to basically believe there's no other possibility that exists outside it and so you know shows like this all of the like and it's in the tradition of the bachelor franchise right it's just like you know that that's its outcome there's no other outcome than engagement and marriage right that's not possible like dating is you know, we're past the point of being okay with that, except for a one week moment where you have to make snap decisions about who to like, which stranger to live with for three weeks. Then, I mean, I don't know if you watch Love is Blind, but then you wrangle in your family and friends to meet this stranger and you have to like look your mother in the eye and be like, we're engaged. <laughs> like you have to like, like people pulling their like immigrant parents who wanted the best for them. Who yeah. show up and then they're like, this frat boy I met three weeks ago is my husband. Yeah. And you're coming to the ceremony with grandma. Like, it's just. <laughs> yeah. Well, they didn't do, at least all they had to do was have like awkward charcuterie with people. It's yeah. just like, you know, <laughs> here's some awkward vegan charcuterie. Uh, like, let's chat about it, you know, um, friend. 
uh, best friend. I love the friend. I wish I, I can't remember the name of Mal and Yelly's friend mm. who's like, this is trash. <laughs> like, I love that friend being like, what are, blink blink twice if you're if you need help. Yeah. Um, you know, so so actually the people who were brought in were really interesting figures. And I'm sad that the reunion show like just kind of left all of that chorus commentary behind and then we just went back to the insular world of the original couples and like the kind of new couple configurations and you know like that that's it again it, it presented to us a closed world in the end but the thing is what the reunion show eventually reveals for us is that the closedness of that world cannot hold right and immediately like of course like duh all this shit is going to unravel like there's nothing surprising in the fact that um, you know, uh, a show that built to a denouement of multiple engagements and acceptances of engagement then becomes a total shit show where people storm away during a reunion taping. Of course. Yeah. And then also Joe Swish offering to officiate a wedding. Give me a break. <laughs> so I've been listening to a show called Reality Gays podcast mm-hmm. and they were, I can't even remember what her name is. Joanna something Swisher. They call her Garcia, Joe Swish. Joanna Garcia, Swisher. Joanna Garcia Swisher, sometimes Joe Swift, Swift Swiffer. Um, she's a straight woman who's the host of this show. And I don't want to get to the I want to tell people what happened in the finale before we get to the reunion. But I just it feels like such a bummer and like a, a mild hate crime to have her as the host of this show. It's like really to have her say the word finger out loud. I was like, stop it. At the same time, I think that it's great to have somebody who is alien to the world of lesbianics there to, you know, <laughs> there to just kind of be some sort of litmus strip or like, you know, um, and also to see just like, you know, to see what some random straight people would say about like this kind of environment, uh, you know, aka, you know, finger gate or whatever, what have you like, um, you know, one of my favorite moments in the, you know, earlier part of the series is when they all assume she's going to be queer and she's not. And she's like, nope, not at all, you know, or what have you. She may be slipping Xander some DMs, you know, like yeah. many of these other people who are like hot, all of these other like straight lady chasers who are like hot for Xander now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm getting distracted here. But, 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 which I, again, like, I think I don't mind because. It isn't a closed queer world. It isn't a show that is demanding like nuanced and uh, subtle and smart queer commentary. The very structure of marriage is a heteropatriarchal construction. So let's just be honest about who oversees that and who legislates Mm. that in our culture. That is your Joanna Garcia Swishers of the world, your Jay Swishes, Joe Swishes, and having like some, you know, responsible queer host like you or me i think you know would we'd be great at that we'd be great at it but at the same time we'd just be like you know um maybe it would be great to bring some of us in later on but to like keep honest the very structure and principle of this this is a heterosexist heteropatriarchal formation and this is us and what we look like when we're scrambling to figure out how to signify in that realm oh my god it's true it's true we got to see the, the wizard behind the curtain by having Joe Garswish there as the <laughs> as the host. Well, okay, so to run through ahead. the finale, okay, we left on a cliffhanger of Mal and Yoli. Mal, who I think is just trying to keep it cool for the cameras. We may never know what Mal's personality is actually like. Mal kept to me. I think Mal just kept it kept it like a hundred percent the way they wanted to present themselves for the cameras. A hundred percent Virgo. Like you know, I would I would be completely aware the entire time that I was in that space they'd have to get me really juiced and loaded to break down but and I think that Mal showed that like you know if anything Mal demonstrated really supreme Virgo behavior supreme Virgo Mal is proposing to Yoli who were all like Yoli's not going to accept because Yoli's uh involved with fuckboy Xander and Yoli says yes immediately like there wasn't even a pause like there wasn't even a dramatic pause I didn't even cut one into the edit it was just like it was like instant capitulation and I was a little bit like huh that seems kind of strange given what we've been shown about her investment in the Xander sitch yeah 
And they look so sad when they're engaged. You sent me some screen grabs of them from the end of uh, the finale where they're just like both frowning and looking so tentative in between being, but also like as soon as Mal proposes and you always like, yes, um, then Yoli gives a little speech about being in love with two people. And Mal is completely generous and more magnanimous than I would be in real life in that situation. Mm-hmm. Mal's like, now that you have the ring on your finger and you're reminding me that you're still in love with Xander, it's okay. We'll work it out. I see you. I love you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's where, you know, that's where it rings false. Absolutely false. Because even, you know, either Mal is just like super enlightened and going to be the most ideal poly partner in the world, or they know that that's what they need to say to keep this tentative, like packed to marry each other intact, right? Like they, like they know that they're on shaky ground and part of like, you know, reflex Virgo behavior is just to be like, I'm going to, you know, make you feel safe. I'm going to make you feel stable. And so you're going to drop this bomb on me, but my response is going to be, to be like, okay, yes, I hear you. I mean, I've fully Virgo in that way before, you know? Really? Well, we had a glimpse. I realized we had a glimpse of Mal's actual personality in like the first or second episode when Yoli was like, I'm going to choose Xander. And Mal was like, that was my fear that I thought that like that, like skinny little white which person was your type. And then yes. Yoli shuts down the conversation and is like, I can't talk about this anymore and leaves. Yes. That was when we saw like a glimpse of Mal having a feeling and like being honest and Yoli just shut it down. Mm-hmm. And But Mal, I think that in their dynamic, Mal knew, Mal knows, Mal knew how to, you know, um, I mean, it's, it's like full, full out codep behavior, of course, but it's, you know, but Mal knew how to sort of establish what Yali needed to hear in a given moment, even if that's not what Mal fully believed in. Cards always close to the vest. Anyway, yeah, that's how the, the finale episode opens. And, you know, uh, then everything kind of in between that and where the finale episode ends just feels silly and overdetermined. And also a little bit like, man, none of these people should be proposing and saying yes or what have you Um, okay tiff and mildred we open on tiff putting on some butch mascara before meeting (laughs) mildred on a cliff that we all thought one of them was going to throw the other one off of uh tiff gives a long speech that mildred interrupts to be like are you done like mildred like cannot stop being a little hostile like a little on edge like mildred maybe thinks that tiff's gonna let her down and so she's like are you done talking but then tiff was like wait i was just getting to my point love is easy to spell but is hard to understand like very <laughs> long speech love is like the coffee that wasn't that like there was something the about perfect blended blend coffee. like the coffee you bring, me, bring in me in the morning your simplicity your complexity intertwined <laughs> with your irresistibility if somebody said nicole your simplicity i would be like i would push you off the cliff yeah like, it's off done. the cliff already yeah yeah. I wouldn't say the hostile passive aggressive comment. I would just throw off the cliff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. No warning. Just boom. Yeah. So they say, yes, they're engaged. Yes. They say, yes, they're engaged. You're like, oh, I thought that that thing in like, that was ruining the line of uh, Tiff's back pocket, you know, that big poof. I thought that was like their <laughs> microphone pack, but it turns out it was uh, actually a ring and the mic pack together in one pocket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should have worn cargos for the engagement, but exactly. I- Should have, yeah. Um, the hilarious thing about the Sam and Ozzy proposal, okay, which was that that one was actually edited pretty well because that also had a little moment to it where Ozzy furnishes something from their pockets and it happens to be a heart shaped stone. It's like Labradorite, <laughs> Labradorite magical stone after telling a story about penguins on the beach. Yeah. High it's lesbian like a, content. Yeah. Pe- penguin story. It's like, exactly. It's like, it's sort of like weird naturalistic, like Zembo ramblings. And then you get the rock, not the metaphorical rock, but the literal rock handed to Sam and you see Sam's face. And at that moment, if I were Sam, I just have like trotted away. Yeah. Like, hell no. Like, what the fuck, Ozzy? Come on. 
here's this rock. And she goes, thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Oh, thanks. But then so you could tell she's pressed. And then Aussie gets down on her knee and is like, here's the rock I found in the beach. And it looks like a class ring. Like it's such a weird wedding ring. And then Sam's delighted yeah. and says, yes. That is the thing. You know, the thing that I'm most shocked about with the outcome of the, the finale episode is that Sam said yes. I think given where at least what we were shown um, and Sam's kind of coming to consciousness and coming to terms with her own sense of growth and freedom and like kind of even like having grown beyond the relationship, frankly, um, and feeling her powers as a healer full blown that she would not like she, that she'd be done with tending to Ozzy's tantruming and, you know, what about me? Why did you listen to me? And it's just, I didn't like, do it. I didn't fucking do it. I didn't do it. You're a, I was like, what a bebe. I just yeah. like, really, you are 42 years old. This Nicole is where, I don't know what you would have done if you had actually selected Ozzy as your trial spouse, but it's just, you know, it's just like, it's just, that's what I mean. Like, you know, Mildred got a kind of bad rap, I think, for, look, Mildred is no picnic either. Mildred is extremely bossy in various ways and also doesn't really listen very well. But that said, you know, the fact that Mildred was getting up, cleaning everything, like making feel like, you know, essentially um, while Ozzy was again, receding into themselves and only ordering takeout for themselves. And then, yeah. you know, kind of crying in the corner um, whenever they were uncomfortable. It's just, Yeah. Anyway, did, why Sam? Why did you stay? Why did Sam stay? I mean, the queer struggle is real. Both of those people have so much trauma. I know you are suspicious of the amount, perhaps, but I'm both- not so suspicious. I think that I'm sure that that you know Ozzy has trauma. I think that there are others in our text thread who are suspicious of the, the depth of Ozzy's trauma, but we will I, not call them out. No, but but both of those people have a lot of trauma, and it's just I w- I wish them the very best in taking care of themselves. Well, I think that one of the things that many of us had hoped for was that Sam was going to emerge from this series like a single woman who was going to get a lot of play, honestly, and a lot of people who were also just as therapized and just as, you know, and and more present and like less kind of self torque that Sam would actually get real dating experience, not the ones she had with the crying butches of the ultimatum Tiff and uh, Tiff and uh, Ozzy. Oh my God. I really, I, I told that I feel like at some point in the show, Sam is in the femme version of the sunken place where she is just trotting after these crying butches, being the voice of reason, holding them. It's like very stone butch blues, kind of like my femme holding me while I cry. As they're whisked away in minivans. As they're whisked away in minivans by the producers who I would love to talk to about dealing with crying butches after years of doing straight uh, reality TV. (laughs) What a different experience. Okay. Wait, so then, so we know, oh, so then Xander and Vanessa get together and they basically break up. Um, well, wait, Zan- Ray and Lexi, let's just quickly cover that. Oh, Ray and Lexi. Was such a blip. Like they're like, okay, Ray and Lexi are in the greenhouse and they're, I, I, I barely processed what was happening there because it was just like, okay, you know, Lexi's going to steamroll Ray into marrying her. Yeah. And that and was that. That was that. But Lexi's a Capricorn. And most of my friends believe that both of those people are butches. Both of those people are secret butches. Give them LHBs. a few years. Yes. Yeah. And then, I mean, spoiler alert, dogs. Lexi now has uh, via TikTok that Lexi now has short hair. It's brown. She's wearing a whole bunch of weird like puka shell necklaces and like baby necklaces. And she's like, I can't believe I wore those heels on TV. I would never do that again. I'll never have blonde. This was the last moment of bombshell. Like the fina- the reunion was the last like body con dress, like made up femme presenting moment in Lexi's yes. career. Yeah. And, you know, um, like Ray, I know, is a basketball player at uh, at UC Irvine. Zot, 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 go anteaters. And, you know, Ray, uh, 
uh, Ray is just, you know, like Ray is like a chill sport day, you know, like let her be a, an athlete. Let her be an athlete. Let Ray run free. Let her date other athletes with visors. Let her date other athletes with high ponies. Let them go to sandals together and enjoy themselves. You know, it's a sort of like, I think that like Lexi was having, Lexi has been having an interesting set of gender journeys, frankly. Um, and that TikTok video is super fascinating. You know, Lexi was uh, is a graduate of USC. And I wish that she was your student. I, I wish. wish that Lexi would have taken a gender studies class. I don't think she did. Me too. At the time, because then we could have like, you know, worked through some of this stuff a little bit. <laughs> I was really feeling for Lexi today as I was driving to record the podcast, because I was thinking about those jugs that nature gave her. And I was thinking about how it feels or how, you know, for people I know, and then at some point for me as a teenager to want to have a more masculine or even gender neutral, more body and having just like this thing that signifies femininity and sex to everybody on the street happen to your body. And it seems like Lexi just kind of went with that and was like, this is what's happening. I'm going to dress for the occasion. But now I see Lexi's kind of pulling back from well, yeah. And Nicole, you've seen my gender journey in photographs. I mean, you've only known me to be, you know, butch appearing and like in with this p- same fucking haircut forever. But, uh, you know, like I, I went through my own lexified journey, like kind of for me, though, that came before I came out and was sort of like, you know, in the, and maybe even in the first year or two that I was out, like, I, I think I both inhabited both Lexi's and Ray's gender journeys. Uh, you know, before I came out, I like wore these bodicey tops. And, you know, it was also like the early 90s and late 80s. So it was like, you know, giant, like blousy pirate tops with like, you know, my cleavage, like bursting through those like little, drawstring like oh, yeah. drawstrings <laughs> long nails long hair doing what I could to I think you know um basically uh overcompensate for the the growing awareness of my homosexual desires by being as ultra feminine and available quote unquote in a kind of heterosexually signifying femme femme way again, late 80s, early 90s. And I say that about myself. I'm saying, you know, I'm not denying Lexi's feminist and yeah. her femme presentation at all. Um, and then and then I gradually kind of got a little more sport dikey and like a little bit more athletic. And then it's just, it's, then the bob, then the short hair. So, you know, like it's a whole journey. So when I say I wish that Lexi would have been my student, it is not you evil assholes who think we indoctrinate people uh, at you know, educational institutions, it would be to talk through and talk about like, what's it like to experience, you know, a, a, a different range of um, one's desires to present oneself in the world? Like, what's it like to have a different, an evolving sense of who you are and what you want to look like? Yeah. I was also thinking about that conversation we had when your book came out about Karen Carpenter mm-hmm. and about that kind of specific sort of anorexia to try mm-hmm. to whittle one's body away from looking like overtly feminine mm-hmm. or what society thinks yeah. of as feminine. And I was thinking anyway. about that for Lexi. Anyway, I, I, I just was getting sad about it because I remember growing boobs at a young age and being like, no. And anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess we were going to gloss over that, but then we had a whole yeah. full on yeah. like recuperative because not that Lexi recuperated herself in the reunion, which I know we're going to get to, but it's just, you know, the different opinions shifted a little bit once we yeah. got the postmortem, but go ahead. Oh no, my no, God. No, of no. course. When the show started, I was like, Lexi's a hero. Look, Lexi giving a speech. And then like one episode later, I was like, oh my God, Lexi's a monster. Anyway. Okay. So then Xander and Vanessa break up. They cry. Xander has overplucked eyebrows. I also relate. I also relate. It would be hard for me to be like a hard butch right now because I have no eyebrows. What would I do? I would have to be manscaped. I think that's what happens, you know, just as an answer to people who ask about like overplucked butch eyebrows. I think that it's people who browscaped, you know, in their teens or in their youth or leading up to their emergence as a butch. Yeah. And then they just don't grow back. Right? They don't so grow they back. Just, they don't grow back. So then you're just kind of like left with the brows. So and it's not that like people are continuing to pluck them necessarily. I can't answer for Xander, but 
But I do know, like, because I know plenty of a lot of also particularly brown butches who I know who were doing what I was trying to do back in the 80s or 90s and trying to present in a more acceptable gender format for the world did eyebrow plucking they were just like it just they just never grew back and so now they look like this very pretty right yeah, you know so just... anyway but also back to Vanessa and Xander as you were saying not ju- not just that they break up though I think that we need to pause here for a moment and see how in scene one oh wait Vanessa and Xander sorry I was going skipping to Yoli and Xander. let's 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 go Vanessa and Xander break up okay now Yoli and Xander Yoli takes off her wedding ring to go meet Xander. Yoli got proposed to like two hours ago or something, takes off her wedding ring to go to Xander. They canoodle, they nuzzle. Um, they both light up when they see each other. Xander more or less proposes without pulling out a ring. Yoli's like, I love you the most. And then they oh. trot out into the woods. Oh, then they're like, then they were like, then Yoli's kind of like, but I just accepted a proposal. And then she's like, let's walk off together. And then they nuzzle in the woods. And then there's like handheld Blair Witch camera. Yes. Yeah. Like very like Blair Witch, um, like, you know. Bigfoot uh, cam. Bigfoot cam. They run because we see Yoli basically devastated that she already agreed to marry Mal, right? And it's sort of, and it's in keeping with what we've seen throughout the series, though, where Actually, some of Yoli, I know, is a really kind of popular cast member throughout the entire run. And I always really liked Yoli while I was watching the series. But then, you know, with hindsight, when you think about the shady things Yoli did, i.e. how she concealed certain things from Mal or told Mal, I'm just going to go have a processing convo um, when there was you know, more canoodling and handholding and stuff like that, then, then, you know, you see, you see that replicated in how she approaches Xander uh, at the end of the show, because it's sort of like, I'm sure Mal would be upset and probably was upset when she saw what went down after the proposal was accepted. And that was that, you know what I mean? Yeah, he only got really confused and just could not tell the truth to anyone. He only just yeah. couldn't tell the truth to anyone. Can I say, though, that um, actually my prize for most growth goes to Xander and Vanessa as a couple insofar as mm. they began the series with Xander being totally like codep, believing that they had to marry Vanessa that that's that was it that was the end that was the solution and with you know Vanessa being like I don't know, I don't know and wanting to cause chaos and fuck around and do whatever to them actually both seriously realizing and accepting that they needed to be single and apart at the end that the most growth award they get miss congeniality exactly most growth as a couple you mm-hmm. know as a couple because it's just like all of these couples really should have broken up and they're the only ones who truly did I mean, thank God for Yoli as like Yoli being the catalyst for that. Today's episode is brought to you by Jamie Rabin, Kale McHurst, and Zella Minor House. If you would like to support Sagittarian Matters, in particular, producer Chris Sutton, please send $5, $5 million, that's your business, via PayPal to hornetleg at gmail.com. Or, this just in, he's got a Venmo. Hell Books on Venmo. That's H-E, double hockey sticks, books. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to saying your name on the podcast. Producer Ponyo looks forward to it, too. Don't be scared, that's just Ponyo's speaking voice. Okay, so we need to get to the reunion. We don't have much time. Mm-hmm. Tiff shows up wearing a full Magic Mike Chippendales outfit. We're talking a white vest, white pants, pink and shawl white. Shawl collar vest. Full collar vest. Shawl collar. Shawl collar. Shawl collar vest. Mal's wearing a sheer flowered button up with a flower. Lexi is wearing a just a wild, a wild dress. I, de- I can't describe it. It's like a flapper dress, but it's also like, I feel like for some reason, like all the femmes on this show got some kind of like deep contract with some kind of body con sort of like 
dress factory where they all were forced to wear dresses from, I don't know. Anyway, everyone's wearing body con. Um, Jay Swish, Jay Gar Swift uh, comes on the scene and it just right off the top, we're talking about finger gate is what she calls it, which I just, just for people to, who want to cringe and die inside of themselves on episode three or something. Um, it turns out that Vanessa had sex with Ray, but Vanessa referred to it as fingering. Yeah. Which is like, if you, when I was in high school, people called it fingering. When I yeah. turned gay, when I <laughs> officially entered, it nobody calls it <clears throat> fingering. Yeah. I'm, and also I was super disappointed. Again, another reason Lexi should have taken a gender studies class while she was at USC, but <clears throat> super disappointed in her description of gay sex is just different and like you know that that like it, w- it was a very bad and not not very considered explanation of the distinctions between gay sex and i guess presumptively heterosexual sex of some yeah. kind but you know i mean i'm just also like why just frame it that way why even like go there anyway that was super soups disappointing super lame and it's like they couldn't even squeeze blood from that rock anymore like no. nobody wanted to talk about it it was just like it was done and there was nothing left to to you know gin up around no. that except for ray self-flagellating because lexi made her feel so bad for having sex with the person on the show that lexi brought her to Exactly. Where you're supposed to basically be in a relationship with somebody else for three weeks. Like, I just feel like Ray's been part of like multiple prison experiments. Like, I just like this like thing of just like the Purdue, like the Stanford prison experiment. Like the, the producer's just like completely manipulating the circumstances to like get Ray so blasted and Vanessa so blasted on like those tin cups and then sleep in the same bed. And I just, what do you think is going to happen? Well, I mean, yeah. I, I want to get to, though, I think as a continuation of what we were talking about with the finale episode, the fact that Mal and Yoli, of course, did not last like more than two weeks after filming before breaking up. And with Mal starting to confront Yoli about some of the shady behavior that I think we all just accepted and absorbed in a way, right? Yeah. Mal said after watching the show, Yoli feels like a dangerous stranger to me. Mm. because that that was the phrase like in an article that you read right that was in the reunion she said it in the reunion oh did she say that in the reunion she said i can't believe i've been with you and in your proximity in a close friend circle for five years and now you feel like a dangerous stranger to me oh yeah and like we're like family but like you know you're a distant cousin now like a kind of shady cousin well Uh, that's how mal uh, painted yoli so they broke up after two weeks then it turns out Yoli and Xander's relationship, once it hit the light of day, it just dissolved. They met up at Coachella. They watched Megan the Stallion together. I think that's the moment it died. As you, when, you described the scene. <laughs> when Yoli got to see Xander just grooving to Megan the Stallion, Xander trying to hold Yoli from behind and just sway while they're watching. I could see Yoli being like, oh my God. So in Chicago, this is not Yoli's scene. This person is not Yoli's scene. No, all. no. And neither is Yoli Xander's scene. No, obviously Yoli um, Xander is like a fitness person slash physical therapist slash living yeah. Aloha and Kona and just yeah. doing like yoga on the beach. Not yeah. that Yoli doesn't have yoga on the beach. Um, Ener- energy. energy <laughs> also, I think that that is where their Venn diagram intersects. Working like, out. Yeah, but I think that like the unbearable whiteness of Xander is just like at some point was just like okay, like this is this is a bit much, you know. In Chicago, Yoli puts on queer nights specifically for black and brown people. Like she is yeah. deep in a different BIPOC life than Xander's kind of anemic noodle situation. Yeah, and and but but also that one of the things that comes out that we should underscore too is that there is um, that Vanessa drops this information during the, uh, the during the reunion is that Yoli and Xander were plotting like a vacay in Hawaii together, 
Like, so yeah. this was being plotted after Yoli was still supposedly engaged to Mal. And Mal had never heard any of this. And I, I kind of, you know, I've gone through the whole spectrum of feelings about Vanessa through the show that, that the producers made me feel mm-hmm. by, you know, by everything that they showed. Um, but I did feel like this was like a nice moment for her after all these girls had ganged up on her, like Yoli and Lexi, like the first among them, it was kind of Vanessa looked like a cat that had swallowed a bird when she was like, Oh no, they met in Coachella. And Mal was like, what? And then Vanessa's like, and I think there was talks about Yoli going to Hawaii too. And Yoli's like, what's Hawaii? Wait, where, what? And then someone jogged her memory and she was like, Oh yeah, I guess we were uh, at some point maybe gonna meet up all reality couple scandal traces back to either coachella stagecoach or hawaii anyway that's what i have to say from watching even bachelor in paradise or what have you those those are like hotbeds of kind of uh pre or post show drama absolutely Mm -hmm. um okay so let's just get let's just get to it tiff and mildred yeah tiff and mildred at the reunion so Tiff starts by saying, Joe Garswish is like, how's your dog? Tiff is like, Shiloh had surgery on Christmas. Mildred's like, you want to tell me the, ex- I didn't really understand this. Basically, they had a no contact order because they're so broken up. Mm-hmm. And then Tiff used the dog getting sick as a reason to break that no contact order around the holidays. And Mildred was pissed. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um- and we find out things didn't go so well. They moved in together. Tiff tried to get them to split the rent three ways because three Mildred has ways. a kid. Mildred yes. has like a dependent. She has a special needs child. Teen who is 16. A, yeah. And and there's Mildred, the special needs teen and Tiff. And yeah, Tiff wanted them to split rent three ways. Mildred underscored the fact that Tiff was supported by her at various points financially. Um, um, and not just kind of wanting to split the rent three ways. But in other ways, too, the various entrepreneurial, I guess, energies that Tiff has. Like Tiff has a podcast called Fweebs that I watched on YouTube. As as you know, Karen, I will do the deep dive and watch (laughs) the terrible podcasts on YouTube, as with the Holderness family. Just for the podcast, I learned from Tiff's podcast that their co-host hates Mildred, that Tiff has never heard of a cardigan and has never dated a girl librarian-ish enough to even wear a cardigan. Uh, mm-hmm. And Tiff also doesn't happen to know if babies come out of the ovaries of the uterus. Hey, who does know that? Who does Any, know that? But something <laughs> yeah, something kind of harsh comes up, which is Mildred mentions that Tiff dropped a dime on her. Tiff called the cops on Mildred one night. Yeah. Uh, and there was, I think that there was just so much chaos in that scene or in that moment of that, that flurry of revelations There was a dog gate that was thrown. There were, you know, there there were obviously they've had huge fights. Also, Mildred alluded to Tiff punching walls, ripping things down, that that there's like physicality and, you know, uh, DV in the mix. And maybe we'll put a trigger warning ahead of this episode so folks know we're going to be discussing that. But like, I, you know, one thing, so those are, that's what happens, but people have been dragging the show and dragging Mildred in particular, calling Mildred a criminal of some kind because the cops were called on her in this domestic violence scenario that Netflix should be held liable. There's a Twitter thread that I shared with a group about this. And there are a lot of people chiming in about that. Um, But a, that is, like just so profoundly carceral and also kind of really kind of anti anti femme like anti anti latina honestly um we still haven't determined if tiff, tiff is also tiff's not latina tiff. okay yeah right but tiff, we don't i but tiff did yeah, not when right? i when somebody asked tiff that in the stories and tiff answered they didn't clarify a different race or okay. a different yeah, so I do think that there's something going on there. And what 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 we what is revealed to us in the reunion episode is that they had a very intense, tumultuous relationship that sounded very mutually abusive. It sounded like also Tiff's demands for attention were in response to the fact that Mildred had a special needs dependent to take care of 
um, that took time away from the relationship, you know? Yeah. Um, and they hadn't lived together before the show. So they moved in together after the show and all of this went down. Oh, hardcore. It's just, and, and but nobody, it doesn't get resolved. It's not like Joe Swish really, I think, had the capacity to hold this conversation anyway. She was like, what? What? Because then Tiff just gets up and leaves and storms out crying. And then Sam goes and runs after Tiff. And yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Anyway, it was somebody named Liz on Twitter who said that they were sad that um, that they, they said that Netflix was completely irresponsible to invite Mildred onto the episode. One of the things that true to form, Sam chases after Tiff and goes and caretakes Tiff yeah. uh, outside. And, and, <clears throat> and it's Ozzy also kind of harshes Mildred and implies that they felt abused by Mildred. Of course, I feel that that's also dis- like, I think that's a specious sort of claim on Ozzy. We saw the footage, right? Uh, like that, that Ozzy's abusive patterns are enacted through passive aggression, not yeah. outright aggression. So that's, it's also like, you know, that level of passive aggression is also abusive, right? But that, you know, but, but again, there's Sam being the caretaker running off to, to take care of Tiff, their former trial spouse. Yeah. The fact is that like also Sam and Ozzy are still together. Yeah. Which, you know, they're still together. They're not yet married. Oh, and also Ozzy's parents still don't know that Ozzy is gay or named Ozzy or engaged. Yeah. Or and I just don't understand how that level of closeting is possible with this kind of media storm. Maybe that's changed. I'll, I've offered to go because I'm going to be in Australia again at the end of the summer. So I'm like, I'll go by Ozzy's house and talk to their parents <laughs> for them. Just like, please give Sam a better, like, you know, existence here at this point. You know? Oh my God. There was a lot. I was remembering when Ozzy and Sam got in that fight and Ozzy just shut down and started calling Sam mate. That is oh such a diss. That is like calling her like dude or bro. That is like, Ozzy did that to Mildred and to Sam. Like, let's, I've been wanting to bring this up. I forgot to bring it up in the last uh, episode about this. Like, yeah, the minute like Ozzy feels like cornered, they become passive aggressive and they call somebody, their their person, mate. I don't know, (laughs) mate. It's just just like, mate. Yeah, it's just like if Kaya and I got in a fight and I was like, I don't know, bro. I don't know, dude. You go do your own thing. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah. yeah but like exactly. an aggro, ag- but that happened with multiple couples on this show. I can't remember who else, but somebody else, like you can see them shut down and call their partner something like bro. <laughs> it's just- yeah. Yeah. The main thing was just like extra aggressive. I'm going to ask the lesbians of, of Australia, like if it's a thing where like when people fight, especially like between dykes or between queer people, if like calling somebody mate in that aggressive way is like a thing. You know that that signifies very specifically, but um, I did. I mean, also, it feels very friend zone. Okay, go ahead. It is, but no, no, no. But I did want to say that I found out that um, between Oz, well, Ozzy and Sam said that the only cast members they would invite to their wedding in an interview, like post mortem interview, are Tiff and Vanessa. Weird. So, right? Isn't that weird? Tiff and Vanessa are the only cast members from Ultimatum that Sam and Ozzy, who are still engaged and still planning on getting married whenever Ozzy finally comes out, like, uh, would only invite those two. I didn't even know that they were friends with Vanessa. I've never even seen them interact with Vanessa. No, me neither. And then, like, what? I, there's so many other people on the cast. It's very curious to me. Um, I do want to say that after Tiff storms off, Meldred gives an update on her life and says, I'm happy that I'm happy. And I love love a poet of our time, <laughs> this show. And the also blended coffee poet, <laughs> the blended co- you're, you're as perfect to me as the coffee you bring me in the morning says Tiff to their femme. Um, so I want to say that definitely at this uh, Lexi is like me and Mal are best friends. And then you see in the postmortem interview that we both read that they both refer to their exes as distant cousins. And I just feel like that word came from Lexi's head into Mal's head. 
Yeah, I think, well, Mel and Lexi obviously have become friends also. Capricorn Virgo. Mm-hmm. Let's pause for a second because I'm going to make sure my door. A listener question said, Wait, how did they find? Start ten- again because. Oh. Qu- okay, start again right here. How did they find 10 queer people with zero nuance around the concept of marriage? I <laughs> think somebody on Instagram. Great question. Yeah, we, we you know, that's very easy. <laughs> Just go to Dyke Day. <laughs> go to take day and wander around you'll find 10 people i feel i do feel like the marriage pressure comes up as people's fertility is ticking down because they have like yoli had that clock over her head that was stressing her out yeah and we see her stressed out about that in the reunion episode as well right yeah so you know um yeah all right, Karen, final thoughts. We have five minutes left. What are things you want to say about this show you have to say out loud and or things you have found out after from much research that's taken space in your brain that could have been given other things? Look, I have so many different feelings and thoughts, but I actually want to answer a few listener questions yeah. while with the time that we have left since Great. We, we had a few sent to us. And so, you know, I do want to honor our commitment to answer these questions. Um, I really want to answer the bow tie question because that is something that I want to talk about. Dear Nicole and Karen, why so many bow ties from friend of ducks? Okay. This is a problem that I've had with just a particular kind of NB to mask representation on television, not just ultimatum queer love. And, and frankly, we do do this, do this to ourselves. I think Sometimes mask queer folks use bow ties because they worry that a a long, like a regular necktie, a straight necktie will shorten their torsos. Oh. And so I think that is a fashion consideration around the idea of, you know, the, like, uh, the, and it's also like harder to tie, like you have to learn how to tie a Windsor knot or these various knots to tie a straight tie, whereas you can kind of just, pop a bow tie on if it's pre-tied. Not very many people use the tie your own bow tie. That said, I also think that there's some sort of association between kind of dressiness or formal dapperness and the bow tie. Like dapperness tends to be associated with a kind of arcane range of styles. And part of that is a throwback to like, oh, the quaint bow tie or suspenders or what have you, right? Like all of those particular choices. We recognize those choices. Uh, but yeah, I, I am not a fan. I think that it makes, it's a very toddler, (laughs) toddlery. Like I'm always as, as a mask person, I'm always have to ask myself whether or not my outfit, it, it, whether or not my outfit drips or it drips like a toddler drips, you know, like, because uh, uh, like toddler or like cute dyke, like you never know. right? I really I, don't. I don't have that set of standards. And so I think I often yeah. leave the house looking like a toddler. Well, yeah. So, so, you know, so the, the bow tie, like the bow tie that your parents <laughs> slap on you to go to church yeah, is one of those accessories like the bow tie plus suspenders my goddess like really uh Welcome and to then, Portland. yeah <laughs> yeah right and the other thing about it is you know like i think very few people actually really do pull it off i've also noticed that on television and you know that the way people style non-binary actors is just to slap a bow tie on them Mm, interesting in the diplomat you will see that with a non-binary actor in the diplomat and that character. And I'm just like, this is very, I don't know, there's something very ventriloquist dummy, howdy doody about all of this in a way that is not particularly flattering. And I just want us all people like on the mask spectrum, just to rethink that bow tie sitch. Um, yeah, but th- those are the answers. I, I really thought about this bow tie thing. I'm just like, don't do it. There are a lot of times that, you know, um, Aussie's fashion choices also veer a little ventriloquist dummy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's a little unfortunate. (laughs) I feel like that's what would have drawn me to them on day one. I've been like, you look like a ventriloquist dummy. I did ventriloquism uh, as a kid. That's totally like I can see <laughs> you look at the whole, the point is someone will find it hot no matter what. So and then I get, but then I get stuck with like the biggest weirdo who's not weird in the way I thought they were weird in a really different having a meltdown on the curb and then leaving in a production van. Okay. Yeah. Um, Karen, do you want to choose our next question or 
what questions feel worthwhile of our final yeah, moments? Sure. Okay, this is a, a sort of two parter. One, are you surprised by which couples stayed together? That's John Collins who asked that on Twitter. Um, by the end of the reunion, why or why not? We've answered some of that, but also like as a kind of postscript question from Nas Riahi, will Ozzy walk out on the wedding? Um, and they say okay. yes. But so I think it's sort of um, because in answering John's question, there's only one couple who stays together at the end of the reunion, right? Yeah. With- and that's Ozzy and Sam. Our- I was I was surprised because it seemed like Sam had a new attitude and that Aussie was not there for it. And so I was surprised that they found a way to come together and stay together. Um, and I also was a little, I kind of thought that my predictions had been that Vanessa and Xander would stay together because mm. they had so much, they had years of codependency before this, this short experiment. And I thought that Vanessa would drag Xander back into it. Yeah, that 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 was the most pleasant surprise for me, as I already said, that they actually broke up. I'm not at all surprised that no one stayed together. Of course, you know, the way we find out that Lexi and Ray break up, it's not during the reunion episode where they're all smiles and super into each other. But there's just a doom, doom, doom postscript in kind of thin, like Art Deco font that like... You know, uh, Lexi and Ray have broken up or broke up, and right they after. broke up and called off the marriage. Well, like they, like they, they wouldn't break up or like they would still be planning to get married if they didn't break. I mean, they like, had to put both in. They had to say both. Things. They had to say both. So yeah. So I'm not at all surprised by any of the breakups. Uh, I'm uh, surprised by Sam and Ozzy staying together. But I guess when you have a brand as strong as Saucy tarot readings s-a-u-s-s-i-e then i don't know you got to be in it to win it would you get a tarot reading from sam i would get a tarot reading from sam actually i would trust sam i don't trust ozzy to be a participant in the tarot reading i would not trust saucy with a tarot reading but i would trust sam with i don't i still don't know if i know anything about sam as a human being beyond Sam as a reactor to these chaotic people. Yeah, I I do hope for Sam that, you know, that she kind of steps out from the shadow of the couple or the shadow of the show and is just kind of, you know, gets to be something more than a caretaker and a giver. Yeah. At least that's how they're, that's how her personality is framed, you know, and, and um, I, you know, whatever. Uh, that's maybe that's a lot of like maybe that's my wish as a gaijin too is to kind of see her flourish you know beyond that kind of uh supporting literally supporting role yeah and uh, my wish as a gaijin is also for ozzy to figure stuff out i i also like i know that we make fun of some of these characters and and they are characters, right? Like, I do want to make it distinct that we don't know who these people are or anything no. about them. They could be very well different. We're responding to an edit. We're responding to how people are representing themselves on their social media or what have you. And I do know from reading that Ozzy is undergoing various kind of gender journeys that Sam is supporting them through. And, 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 you know, that's all that was said in the article. I'm not trying to be weird and like repress something about like Ozzy is trans or what have you. I'm just saying that is what they say in the articles. Ozzy is going through a gender journey. We don't know what that journey is. And I know that like, and I hope that, you know, after they kind of go through it for a little bit and, and experience, get to talk to more people and experience more things and get to be more comfortable in themselves that, that maybe some of that aggression and passive aggression goes away. Yeah. Me too. Do you think Aussie will walk out of the wedding? Yes. (laughs) I don't think Aussie will walk out of the wedding, but I think there will be multiple steps before the wedding that Aussie will walk out of. I think that the multiple steps will eventually kill the wedding, you know? Mm. I think that it's all of those multiple steps will finally just be like, no, I can't do it. I think Sam is in it to win it, but like, you know, I will, I would be very shocked if they actually ever did get married. Yeah. And then once they do get married, it might be, if they do get married, it might not last 
it might be like my first quote unquote marriage. Luckily, it wasn't legal. God, that would have been way worse if it was back then. It's an argument for the non legalization of gay marriage, but like, you know, like being 23 and divorced, uh, you know. Can yeah. you imagine trying to go to mediation with Aussie about a divorce? Like, I just can't imagine it would take you forever. It would be like, like in those Orthodox Jew culture, Jewish cultures where you have to like hire someone to go break the legs of your husband to get him to sign the divorce decree. Yeah. Like, I feel like Aussie would not be able to tolerate it. And it would be so difficult. Oh, one thing that we haven't talked at all about is that how people's finances have played into the depiction of all of these cast members and characters, because, you know, we have a very clear sense that, you know, from what Yoli said during the series run that Xander is well positioned financially. Why? We, yeah. I mean, maybe, yeah, you know, I don't know how, but maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe they were also born into privilege and could, yeah. you know, well, they were born into, they were born into more privilege than Mel. And so then yes. comparing their finances seems kind of cruel and unfair. Yeah, it does seem cruel and unfair. Um, the other thing that we know is that, you know, Mildred pointed out also uh, the the financial woes and like the kind of employment instability of TIFFs. Tiff, uh, like TIFFs friend, trying to make money off that podcast. TIFFs trying to now like get, do confidence coaching. And, and cameos for $15. $15? That's yeah. too much of a bargain, TIFF. This is your moment. I know. Charge I 40. Know. I know. You got to charge more right now and then you can reduce it later. But also everybody is so baby crazy that they were making these like wild ass, like many hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of IVF plans of like, I'm going to have her egg and she's going to have my egg and we're going to carry at the same time and hold hands during birth. Like it was just then like, we're going to switch eggs. The IVF <laughs> journeys were like bonkers, like you would need so much money to make these things happen so that you could have these biological children that I was like, I was, mm -hmm. it was a lot. It's true. I mean, I did like, I also, one more thing that I will have to say is that we, we, since we're talking about children, biological children, the reference to fur babies, which is not as a pet person, that is not a good, a phrase that I like. I find it gross. Wait, Karen. I want you to know that I'm now part of a community that has shell babies is what they call their tortoises. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> Nicole, Nicole, what? My new I people. Wanna, I want to talk about the anti-cat, the anti-cat status of Ultimatum Queer Love. It's just like, why no cats? Why didn't, I mean, I guess, you know, maybe some of them have cats, but like they didn't want to fly their cats out to, you know, uh, Maybe Xander has a cat they, and Vanessa has a cat. And maybe as a couple, they had a cat that they didn't want to fly up from Honolulu back to LA because it's like flying animals back and forth. Or, but uh, I have from listening to Tiff's podcast, I can tell you they stayed in a lot of different places too. And some of those places were not pet friendly. So Tiff also had to have their dog like dog sat or have people take care of their dog along the way. Cause some of the hotel we work places they were staying were not dog friendly. So cat, having a cat come and move lots and lots of different places would have been even more. That intense. would have been hard, but it's also just like, and I can say just as a, someone who travels with cats is that, you know, the only place you can rely on is the La Quinta Inn and the Hotel Figueroa. Like, I mean, and there are some other boutique hotels, but most of the time when people say they're pet friendly, it's only dog friendly. But oh. if you're traveling with a tortoise or a snake or a cat, which, you know, um, I think cats, because they're a little more common than some of those other pets should be accepted in more places, but all to say La Quinta Inn accepts all of it. La Quinta Inn sponsor Sagittarian Matters now. I wish I love La Quinta Inn. We just gave you a huge shout out and maybe next time they'll, they'll do like a, a big fancy La Quinta resort in the city of La Quinta in Palm Springs for the next queer ultimatum. I hope that they do another one. So you could have the reptile people, the cat people, the gerbil people, the dog people, yeah. all swapping partners. It's true. I I, do, I feel like I, you know, I was just suspicious that people were like, somebody complained about a cat allergy and that's why they didn't allow any cats. But they Did they say that? Come. No, I just, I just, that's my paranoid reading. 
That's my yeah, conspiracy I, theory. The toxo in your brain made you look into this. <laughs> it made my you wonder. My cosmosis from kissing my cat's paws. Yeah. Worshipping her like the true goddess that she is and him like the, the, the true god that he is. You know, like my cats are like on me making muffins like, you must talk about cats. On Where were the cats? Adam. Where were the cats? Exactly. <laughs> Cat representation will be on the next season. Absolutely. Okay. Any final thoughts? Anything else you want to say? I, I feel like I feel like that's it. I mean, like cats, the bow ties, the you know, the financial discussions. Like the thing that's fun is that mm. our group texts are still going about this. Yeah, the sex board games, sex board games. Mildred, I can't believe we forgot to mention those. So Mildred basically was paying for most of their life. Even though she she's a Zumba teacher and she has this teenager, and then she got Tiff, who like maybe doesn't have a job. And so Mildred was paying for a lot of people's lives, doing a lot of overfunctioning. At some point they moved, they broke up and Mildred moved out. I think maybe because of the police thing. I don't know. But Mildred moved out, came to the house to get some stuff. Tiff wasn't home, but she saw eyeliner, and Mildred was like, I don't wear eyeliner, which is insane. I'm mm-hmm. sorry to use that word, but Mildred has the most eye makeup going on of anyone I've ever seen in my life, like, and more than Drag Race. Mildred is like Drag Race level eyelashes, Kardashian level eyelashes. And I'm like, you're telling me you don't even own eyeliner? Girl, yeah. that maybe if it's tattooed on, I guess. Somebody in that house wears eyeliner. Well, Tiff for sure puts at least mascara, mascara on because we saw Tiff put mascara on. So why not some guy liner? Guyliner. Okay. I'm sure Tiff had guy liner, but, but then like, Mildred- that's also plausible that like Tiff had somebody else over putting. Uh, Absolutely. But then also Mildred was like, and I found sex board games. And then like, Mildred said, I found sex board games. Tiff said, I don't need sex board games. I have plenty of imagination, which makes me think maybe Tiff understood what was in the board game, because why would you even say something so specific as to the board game? stoking the sexual imagination if you had never seen us because i'm like sex board game what is that jenga like what is the sex board game what is that that sounds stupid i'm not like this is to stoke my imagination and my desires bananagrams for sex is it like is it like (laughs) is it like kama sutra cards it's just like you know you like pull hold your partner like a wheelbarrow exactly like pull a new position out every other day. I think that there are such things that like, I think sex therapists use for like helping couples do like reinvigorate their sex lives, but sex board games. I know. I love that. I'm going to like Google sex board games and see what I come up with. That is so <laughs> funny. I mean, I thought Tiff probably got that as promotion for her dumb podcast. No offense, weebs. Um, Tiff probably got that as some kind of like weird thing to try to get sponsored by or so I just can't or I don't know like is Tiff gonna impress a Tinder date or a Raya date now that they've been on TV uh with being like let's play shoots and ladders boner edition. I don't know. Shoots and ladders boner edition. That's exactly <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> shoots and ladders butt plug edition. Butt plug edition. <laughs> I just I don't think of Tiff as being that actually sexually adventurous i know like i think tiff's into like this like performative light sm but i don't think is if tiff is like being that broad yeah that's that's my thought yeah being that broad in their imagination yeah i not think that's that tiff's, broad like oh not, that broad that broad <laughs> i just think of tiff as so basic yeah i think there's of tiff as being basicness there's a lot there's of a lot basicness of- but that's what television is for that is what television does is it presents to us you know, um, the basic and, and it, it allows us to, you know, explore our relationships to the most basic expressions of ourselves. It's never about anything that extraordinary. It flattens all of us out. Mm-hmm. Karen, Reality TV in particular. Yeah. Anyway. My question, my last question for you, and I'll answer this for myself. How would you be as a trial wife on this show? What are the reviews that your trial wife would give you when you <laughs> moved in and cats can come? Okay. I think that, uh, I think I would get pretty decent marks because I would cook, but if I was paired with a vegetarian or a vegan, that might be an issue because we might fight over the fact that I would want to like to cook animal protein, like all the time. Right. You know, whatever in the, 
in the trial we work apartment. Uh, but I think that the part of why I speak about Mal's like sort of Virgo keeping it tight thing is I would be super self-aware of like trying not to impugn myself too much in that situation. And so I might be accused of not opening up enough or being open to the journey enough or being closed off to it in some way, you know? Um, So that's, I think that those would be the main criticisms that, that I I would maybe sleep with my cat on the couch instead of in the bed with the other person or make the person who didn't want to sleep with a cat in the bed, sleep with a cat in the bed. Would you, you know? yell? Why can't you look at my cat? Like you love her. Why can't you oh, look I, at yeah. her? Like she deserves. Yeah. Yeah. I'd just be like, you know, she is a person you need to love her. Yeah, exactly. I'd probably tiff out right there. How about you? Well, if I got paired with a partner with a cat, I I'm allergic. So I would pet it robotically with the back of my hand and they would be like, <laughs> why won't you pet her? Like you partner. I also think they would be like, I mean, also Karen, you sleep, do you sleep with like that face, like a CPAP? Oh face? yeah, it's true. I sleep with a CPAP. So it's either like, cause I have sleep apnea. So they would either film me snoring in a really kind of deathly and frightening manner, or they would show how sad it was that I like had to ho- look like a robotic Mr. Snuffleupagus if I wanted to breathe through the night when I slept. I just imagine your trial wife being like, oh, dear God, is she dead? Yeah. yeah. And then you come back online. Oh, I've I've shared hotel rooms with folks, even just like I'm roommates at conferences and like they've like shook me and they're like, it sounds like you're choking on yourself. You need to like sit up. You need to like, this was before oh I wore the machine. So yeah. Well, I thought about that because I thought about myself going to bed with my sexy new trial wife and then being like, Telling the camera, like, Nicole, like, I thought we were gonna have a great time. She put on like the biggest pair of grandma panties I've ever seen, a Beavis and Butthead shirt, a wrist brace, earplugs, and an eye mask, and then grabbed her chihuahua and said, Good night. <laughs> and then I tried to move around a little the night, and she said, Quit fussing, stay still. <laughs> this is what it's like to sleep with me in this heavily romantic scenario. It's like, Quit fussing, <laughs> just, just lay, just settle, yeah. settle down. Um, yeah. And then I do think it would be someone who was so basic that they'd be like, I tried to like put on the Glee soundtrack and slow dance with Nicole in the kitchen. And she just made a face. She wouldn't (laughs) even get into it. She's not open to this experience. Yeah. I think that I'd be not open to the experience for other reasons, (laughs) because I would totally love the Glee soundtrack and just fully slumber party out with whoever it was probably. But yeah, I definitely would not have come into the scenario with like a choreographed sex scene like Tiff and Mildred. I love that they definitely talked about that extensively before they went on the show. Yeah. I mean, I love that they did it and I'm glad that they did it. And because it's also, there's all this grainy footage of like sort of humping from a distance. Like it was just like kind of like the kind of ceiling cameras, like ceiling night vision cameras with like occasional ruffles in the bed coverings, you know, and and it's just sort of like the imply, like, yeah. The dogs of the show are the MVPs for riding out those waves of this bed's a rockin'. We see multiple videos of the dogs being like, whoa, whoa, as the people are under the covers doing their vague grainy humping. It's true. It's true. Yeah, they'd have to close the doors for that. (laughs) Um, And then I think at the final thing, the person would give me a speech and be like, Nicole, you made fun of me. You joked all the time. You were so grouchy and you're a food hoarder. And I can't, and you couldn't get into the experiment. I feel like you're not here for the right reasons. <laughs> and then they would, as they said that, I would be like taking a baguette off their plate to put in a plastic bag on my lap. And I'd be like, what, what, what are you talking about? How many, how many baguette ends are there in the freezer, Nicole? How many baguette <laughs> ends are there in the freezer? The knob, yeah. what's she call them? The knobbies? The um, knobbies. Karen, thank you for this crossover episode. It was really a gift getting to talk to you about this show. Oh, I'm delighted to have gotten a chance to catch up with you in the off season and the amazing race off season. Oh, one more, one postscript regarding the amazing race is that um, full out OBS, Aubrey from last season of the amazing race, who we know is married now, or are they still just engaged? To I don't know, but they're like a perfect couple. Or they're a wonderful, they? perfect, wonderful couple. Aubrey was liking up on Xander's posts recently on Instagram. Hmm. I don't (laughs) wish that for her. Just kidding, Aubrey. We just, we love it. We love that you loved Ultimatum. We don't think you're trying to kick it to Xander. It's all good. There's the same casting director for The Amazing Race. This woman who casted for the show also cast 
cast casted. She cast this show. She cast Love is Blind and she used to work for The Amazing Race. So there's your crossover right there. And I feel like Xander is going to be on The Amazing Race and I'm going to be so bummed. Oh, I mean, I would watch that. (laughs) I would watch it too, but I would be like, that's not my favorite character. Ah, all right. Well, I should run off. I'm already over time here. And, you know, I just like, I can't stop talking about this show. Thanks for having me on. So many hearts to you. And I'll see you when the, the amazing race, the gay amazing race is back. See you then. Bye. Sagittarian Matters is produced by Chris Sutton with assistance by Ponyo Georges. Our theme music is composed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs of the band Bouquet. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time. Sagittarian Matters. Asking you to act like you fear about my dog. Like, it's not that hard. I want a heart. What the fuck am I going to do? I don't care if you have the most gorgeous face, the most gorgeous body, the most gorgeous personality, and the most supportive system. If you don't like my dog, you can get the fuck out.